Hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in to my talk. I'm Girish Nivarti. I'm a postdoc at the University of Leeds. This is work done in collaboration with Professor Brad Marston at Brown University and Professor Steve Tobias here in Leeds. Zonal jets are mean flows that align themselves along the east-west direction in planetary atmospheres. They are found more generally in many rotating flows, but their presence alongside turbulence means that there are implications to the transport of scalars and momenta, and that's why they're interesting, interesting from a modeling perspective. So zonal jets are also present in uh, the atmospheres of the gas giants. The colored bands of Jupiter are an indication of the presence of zonal jets, and measurements from uh, the Voyager mission from the 70s as well as the more recent measurements uh, from the Cassini mission show that these zonal jets are actually persistent both in terms of number and strength. So the presence of uh, these persistent mean flows amidst turbulence is uh, a topic of uh, significant interest. We're interested in developing a theory for zonal jets and we need this to be uh, both adequate and statistical. Well, we're primarily interested in statistical quantities like the zonal mean flow and the fluxes that give rise to it, so it's helpful to formulate the theory in terms of the statistics. And secondly, since these statistics vary smoothly uh, in space and time, we expect to benefit computationally from a statistical formulation. And at the same time, the theory must be adequate and in the sense that it should capture just the right amount of interactions that are needed to predict the correct zonal mean flows. So the basic ingredients uh, involved in the uh, formation and evolution of zonal jets are turbulence and rotation uh, and alongside a layer of the atmosphere may be forced and damped by layers below it from thermal convection and friction, respectively. So these processes can be uh, put together in a differential equation. Uh, this is a statement of the barotropic vorticity equation, where a forcing F is applied and a linear damping with coefficient kappa uh, is also applied. So uh, in general, the Coriolis forces and turbulence appear in the Jacobian J, However, if you simplify these equations, taking a local tangent plane and posing these equations on a doubly periodic uh, planar domain, then the Coriolis forces can be seen to have a linear contribution. And these gives rise to interesting waves in the system. Now, in our work, both on the beta plane and on the spherical surface, we use a very simple uh, forcing function. This helps us in uh, developing uh, and going through the initial stages of our uh, statistical theory development. So the forcing we use is a relaxation to an unstable point jet. Um, uh, essentially this is uh, equivalent to the layer below the layer of interest to uh, impose a zonal velocity profile and as we change the relaxation time we can move from dynamics that are close to equilibrium when relaxation time is very low to dynamics which are more turbulent where there's more time for these nonlinear interactions to evolve when the relaxation time is very large. So that's the key parameter that we change in our simulations to um, move between various parametric regimes. Now when a zonal velocity uh, such as the one shown on the top left is prescribed, the vorticity, which is the curl of velocity, effectively has a hyperbolic tan function uh, imposed. Now, both on the spherical and the beta plane surface, we can write the equation of the motions in a uh, more general form. And this is the form that we'll be looking at uh, throughout the course of our derivation so that we don't stick to a particular set of coordinates uh, but show the form of the derivation of equations. So these equations have a zonally constant term, which is the forcing term, and uh, a linear term uh, arising from damping and Coriolis forces, 
as well as a nonlinear turbulence term. Now, in this fully nonlinear set of equations, the nonlinear term essentially consists of the sum total of all possible interactions in spectral space between the various modes. As DNS folks among you might know that resolving all these modes is expensive in itself, however, computations uh, of these can be uh, more than sufficient, especially when we're interested only in the zonal mean uh, quantities. Moreover, if we're, we are to uh, capture statistics from these equations, we have to integrate these equations for long uh, durations, and that turns out to be doubly expensive. So in our quest for an adequate statistical theory, uh, the fully nonlinear equations turn out to be neither adequate nor statistical. So the first step we want to take is to eliminate some of these nonlinear interactions and move towards a theory which is adequate. Our starting point is the Reynolds decomposition. Uh, taking the mean in the zonal direction, we can uh, decompose the vorticity field into the zonal mean and the zonal fluctuation. And these obey familiar properties. The average of the fluctuation is zero. That's an orthogonality property and the average of an average is an average. <laughs> so that's idempotence. Now, knowing this decomposition, we can apply an averaging to the fully nonlinear equations twice. So we get the equation for the zonal mean equation. Uh, yeah. And notice that one of these terms uh, automatically disappears because it consists of an average of a fluctuation. When we subtract the zonal mean equation from the fully nonlinear equations, we come up with the equation for fluctuations. Again, in this equation, a term vanishes because it is a fluctuating term arising from the product of means. That's not possible, so we get zero. We reduce these equations further by adopting an approach taken by Srinivasan and Young I will look at this eddy eddy nonlinear term, which um, is uh, a product of two fluctuations, uh, giving rise to fluctuations. Eliminating these, we come up with uh, quasi-linear equations. So these are equations in the zonal mean and fluctuation. Now, how do quasi-linear equations perform against nonlinear equations? So previously, Tobias and Marston. Uh, performed simulations uh, which involved stochastic forcing where the system was driven slowly out of equilibrium. Uh, you can think of this as meaning uh, an increasing relaxation time in our case. Now they notice that when the system is close to equilibrium, that is when something like tau is very low, quasi-linear equations uh, pretty much get the uh, right number and strength of jets. Uh, whereas if the system is pushed out of equilibrium, quasi-linear equations start to fail. So as you move towards more realistic parameter regimes, it turns out that QL is too simplistic. So here's what it looks like. We have QL equations on the one hand. They are too simplistic in realistic parameter regimes. And then we have NL equations, which get everything right, but they're a bit too complex, too rich. So we want to be in the so-called Goldilocks zone, somewhere in the middle. So to get to this middle zone, the first thing we do is generalize the Reynolds decomposition. Now think of the vorticity field in terms of its spectral uh, decomposition uh, in its zonal modes. Now, instead of taking the average and fluctuation, or splitting the field into its average and fluctuation, we project the series into low modes and high modes using a filter at cutoff lambda. All the modes that are uh, less than the cutoff wave number are called low modes, and the remaining ones, which are higher than lambda in wave number, are high modes. So we use new notation uh, to depict these, uh, this decomposition. So zeta is a summation of low modes, that is zeta left, plus zeta right, which denote the high modes. Now, interestingly, this projection 
to low and high modes also follows the same properties as the average in fluctuation case. Now the second step we take to move towards the middle zone is uh, we follow the same steps as we did from the NL equations to the QL. So in a sense we repeat the steps, we start with the NL equations. Instead of averaging we now project the equations twice to the low modes so we get similar forms of terms and then we subtract these equations from the NL to get high mode equations. Okay, so notice that we have uh, terms that look similar uh, to the terms we dropped out of QL, but these uh, don't, none of these vanish automatically now. Uh, however, in order to, in, in trying to follow the same formulation as QL, we are to replicate QL like dynamics. Uh, we, uh, we uh, eliminate these interactions. So those are imposed to be zero. All right, so we now get uh, a set of equations which have the same form as the QL, however, they're, they have more complexity. The terms that remain are not simply uh, products of mean and fluctuation, but they're uh, they involve interactions between low modes, so these and high modes. So the nonlinear term, which involves uh, two low modes uh, giving rise to other low modes, consists of non-trivial dynamics, and that's the key to the improvement that GQL helps us get over QL. So we can think of GQL uh, as follows. There's a spectrum of uh, zonal wave numbers and all low modes with wave number less than lambda are described by nonlinear equations and the remaining high modes are uh, formally linear. Now interestingly GQL reduces to QL when lambda is zero. When lambda is zero the projection becomes the mean uh, operation and only the mean equation is nonlinear. And on the other end when the cutoff is the full wave uh, zonal resolution, then all equations are nonlinear. So we, re we recover the uh, NL. All right, so we've improved on the picture we had earlier. Um, we had QL on one side and NL on the other, and we've obtained GQL equations which have the potential to interpolate between QL and NL. So Marston, Cheney, and Tobias recently uh, performed simulations on the, uh, on the beta plane uh, using stochastic fursing, uh, and they compared the effectiveness of GQL at varying uh, values of the cutoff wave number. Now they noticed that QL uh, tends to be indeed a simplistic description, and it overpredicts the zonal velocity in high latitudes, but GQL with even uh, small values of lambda can replicate the essential nonlinear dynamics. So we are in the Goldilocks zone with GQL equations. So in our quest, it seems that GQL is an adequate but not statistical theory. To convert this to a statistical theory, we first define the statistics. These are low order equal time statistics. So the the first two centered moments are the mean and variance, and these we call the first and second cumulant. We're interested in solving for these, uh, so we need to write down equations for these uh, and derive them from the GQL equations. So in order to do that, we follow a familiar recipe. So the recipe goes as follows. Uh, step one, we take the QL equations. These are the equations in zonal mean and fluctuation. We notice uh, that it can be written in the spectral form. Um, it just helps us visualize the uh, first and second cumulants later on better. So the nonlinear terms are essentially here written as the sums of the various contributing interactions. So we notice that the first cumulant 
is the mean. So we already have the equation for the first cumulant. And the second cumulant appears in this equation. So to have a closure, we need to write down this equation for the second cumulant. So we somehow need to derive it from the fluctuation equation. And this might be familiar to several Lorentz-based modelers. What you do is you multiply the fluctuations equation by fluctuations. You symmetrize uh, an average. And this gives us the second cumulant equation. These are called uh, CE2 equations. And they've been developed uh, previously um, by Marston Key and Tobias. And these are also equivalent to the so-called S3T formulation by Farrell and Yuanou. So these equations, most importantly, are closed and are statistical analogs for QL. So just to repeat, we started with QL equations, did a few steps of the recipe, and ended up with CE2. But we know that QL dynamics were too simplistic, and we wanted to be in the habitable zone where GQL equations reside. So we follow the same steps of the recipe, but start with GQL to end up with the generalized CE2, GCE2 equations. So here we are on step one, the GQL equations. These are equations in the low modes and high modes. Now our acting first cumulant is, are going to be the low modes. These are the projected uh, modes. And the second cumulant, which takes the same form as the sec second centered moment, but is instead the projected field bilinear. So this is a, a bilinear term in uh, two high mode fields and projected down to the low modes. So in order to close these um, dy dynamics and form a statistical uh, set of equations, we need an equation for this uh, field bilinear term. And we do this by following the same steps as we did uh, for uh, CE2. We multiply, symmetrize, and project uh, the high mode equations. And the result is a closed set of self-consistent equations um, for the statistics of unresolved modes that are analogs or analogous to GQL dynamics. So a similar formulation has been uh, put forward by Konstantinou, Farrell, and Yuanou uh, in their S3T based um, framework. So here is a summary. On the dynamical side, GQL equations interpolate between QL and NL using the cutoff a wave number in zonal modes, lambda. So the statistical equivalent, GCE2, interpolates between CE2 and NL. So our quest is now complete. We have found an adequate statistical theory for turbulent zonal jets. Time for results. Uh, so we've coded in these equations in two separate pieces of code. On the spherical surface, uh, we, uh, for simulations on the spherical surface, we have a macOS app called GCM, and the beta plane simulations are done using a Julia package that we've developed called Zonal Flow. And the results I'll be showing you are for a large relaxation time. So they, they serve to demonstrate how Firstly, that GCE2 matches GQL results, as one would expect. And secondly, that these two equivalent formulations uh, improve upon the quasi-linear dynamics. So on the sphere, uh, I show energy spectra. The vertical axis here shows the zonal wave number. And you can see at a large relaxation time, a lot of different zonal wave numbers, uh, wave uh, zonal modes are excited. QL, as expected, um, gets only a single harmonic right. And as noted earlier, it ends up being too simplistic. 
However, when we use GCE2 or GQL um, at a low value of lambda, you can kind of replicate uh, the NL spectra. So GCE2 equations more or less reproduce these uh, spectra for a low cutoff uh, value. And on the beta plane, I show vorticity profiles. Um, now, as expected, again, QL under or over uh, estimates the vorticity uh, due to a steeper vorticity gradient prediction at the equator than the corresponding NL. Uh, so these simulations are done at a resolution of 10 over 16, uh, 10 being the resolution in the zonal direction. So these are small uh, simulations as I said, just for a proof of concept. Again, at, at a small value of lambda of 2, GQL gets the gradient at the equator right, and also at the high latitudes. And at a further uh, increased cutoff wave number, which is still significantly less than the highest resolution, um, GQL and GC to get the uh, NL dynamics and predict the correct uh, zonal mean vorticity profile. So to conclude, we were looking for a theory of turbulence zonal jets. We developed an adequate dynamic model called GQL, uh, which interpolates between QL and NL. And in fact, it can be adequate at very low values of the cutoff zonal wave number lambda. And in this talk, we derived the statistical equations corresponding to GQL. We call these GCE2 equations. They have the same benefits of GQL in the sense that they can be adequate at low values of lambda, but they solve for statistics. And so they benefit from the computational gains made by solving directly for statistical quantities. Now, there is one caveat. Since GC2 involves a field bilinear, which is really a four-dimensional matrix in spectral space, we are um, left with the curse of dimensionality. Uh, the, the dimension of the matrix often is much larger than the information contained within it. So we want to use certain dimensional reduction techniques and for some um, insight into what we're doing in our group, please see uh, the talk by Quan Li in session W16 of this conference. The other future work we want to uh, embark upon is to implement stochastic forcing, and this will extend our applicability uh, to a variety of problems. Well, thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at this email address. And thank you for your patience through this talk, and I hope you have a lovely day.